Hello, everybody. Um, Got to get my view right. So, um, happy Tuesday. Uh, welcome to yet another week of uh, your semester. Um, now, I didn't give you a reading assignment due today. Uh, some of the reason is because I, I like a, a lot of how the book covers this material. Uh, I think the book does a great job of explaining very explicitly, here is uh, the process involved, here are the forms involved, here's how to work it. Um, but this chapter, I don't think it covers it very well. Um, form generation is a critical piece of the design process overall, um, but in general, um, it's not it's not extraordinarily straightforward, and I think the book makes it a little bit more muddled. Um, plus, the book really focuses on more of a mechanical emphasis, um, whereas I like to be a little bit more uh, multifaceted, uh, appeal to multiple types of engineering. So for this lecture, um, I'm just going to give it to you straight up. Um, one thing I did like about how the book said this is um, Okay, so the purpose of the lecture today is discussing how do we come up with ideas. Uh, we've briefly discussed this previously in class. Um, if you took my class last semester, uh, you know there are, I, I give you basic methodology for how to come up with a form. Um, the idea behind all of this is let's take, um, you have your problem and then you have your solution. And in between, there's this big gap area where how are we going to take the problem and solve it? Write this a little bit bigger so it's readable. <clears throat> By the way, I'm, I ordered some new um, equipment. So hopefully on Thursday, my live stream will be a lot higher quality. Also, people are installing a giant board in the hallway, so um, this is going to sound like a war zone. Um, if it gets really bad, I'll just be like, we're done. Um, so how do you take a problem and come up with a solution? Okay, What is the process to go from here to here? Well. Inside of here, a lot of people just tell you, this is brainstorming. Um, what does brainstorm mean? It means sit down and think about it. For an engineer, that's, <coughs> excuse me, for an engineer, that's fine. Um, but it doesn't tell you anything. It's, hey, um, you've got this math problem. Come up with a solution. Just do some brainstorming. You'll be fine. You're good. Uh, no, that's... That's not the best method of doing it. Um, in between these two, this is really where, okay, in the problem here, you come up with your measures of quality. How do you know a solution is good? How are you going to rate that solution? What makes a solution better than other solutions? How are you going to compare solutions? That's your measures of quality. You've got your constraints. <laughs> If you're designing a fan system that's going to be installed in a car, you have very, very descriptive size constraints. Your fan must fit in X location, must be X size. If you're designing a, a solar panel, you have much less restrictive means. But then your constraints may be something like, well, no exposed wires. And so if somebody touches this, they're not going to get shocked. Okay? Um, Constraints may be anything from this is physical characteristics you have to have. Um, maybe since you only have rubber material, you have to design something out of rubber. That's a constraint. Okay, but this is just, it's something that restricts your creative freedom and really refines what the solution has to be consisted of in order to be a valid solution. So maybe based on your materials on hand, maybe based on your competencies, capabilities, Whatever it is, this is yes-no conditions that strongly define what the solution has to look like and consist of. Okay, 
Then over here, you have functionality. What do you need to have done? If you're designing a hammer, you need to have something that has a hard surface that can pound in, ha pound in nails and provide some mechanical advantage. Okay, that's what a hammer does. It provides mechanical advantage by, by using a swing motion and converting that into kind of like a lever. Okay, so functionality, constraints, measures of qualities, all of these combine to define what the problem is. And we've talked about how to define the problem. But now how do we take this and come up with a solution for it? Okay, for your project for this class, you've been given a problem where you have to design a pancake printer. I left a lot of this very hazy. Why? Because the, the existing pancake printers that are out on the market right now are not good. Okay, their measures of quality, one of the things that they measure is speed. If you watch the video um, in the project description that I gave you, <laughs> Their measure of quality is how fast a prints a pancake is very poor. Um, I've already heard correspondence from one student who's come up with a much faster way of doing this. And I said, that's awesome. Your solution might be very expensive, um, but that this is the thing. You don't have to make it the same way they did. And sometimes just looking at your measures of quality, looking at your constraints, yes, okay, we have to fully cook the pancakes. If you don't fully cook the pancakes, you don't have a pancake printer, you have something gross that probably is going to be very hard to clean. Also won't be edible. Okay. Um, it, has to, it has to be able to spread the pancake, it has to be able to pour the pancake. Those are all functionality requirements um, that, that are necessary for your device. Now, how do you take what you know the device has to do and maybe add on a few, maybe you think, uh, not just speed is important. Maybe you think variability of size is important. Maybe you want to have the, the ability to change up the thickness of the batter. Uh, if you're a pancake connoisseur, or you know, not all pancakes are made equal. Some pancakes are just simply better. Are you going to require whoever's going to use your machine to have the exact same pancake consistency every time? If you do, um, it does make your machine a little bit harder to work with. If they don't get it exactly right, your machine won't function right. But it also makes things simpler for you. It reduces your design freedom because it also means you have to solve less problems. Um, the more constraints you have, the fewer problems you have to solve because they've already been solved for you. You only have one option. Okay? So I didn't give you a lot of this because some of it is an exercise in you being able to show me how you can take these individual elements and really critically analyze them to figure out how a solution works. Okay, but how do we take this then? You've come up with a problem. You know what you want this to do. You know the constraints on it. You know it has to be powered by a general electric power outlet. Um, it's probably not going to be something where you're powering it with a flamethrower. Maybe you do. I don't know. Have you got to give your standard issue flamethrower that goes along with your, with your pancake printer. Whatever that is. But how do you take your problem now and convert that into solutions? Well, if you did your problem framing correctly, you have a list of these and a list of these and a list of these that are very succinct. They're, in, they're distinguishable from each other. You can tell the difference between them, that kind of a thing. Okay. Um, Having these three things simultaneously and knowing how to work with them, we then bring them over, and this is kind of the brainstorming phase. I call it ideation because it's more than just brainstorming. I've always hated the word brainstorming, um, even when I was in elementary school, because it means nothing. It means sit down and think. That's it. Um, and there are actually a lot of very good psychological evaluations of how to do a correct brainstorm. Um, none of them ever worked for me. This works for me. And this is what I'm teaching you. And if you can just sit down and think about stuff and come up with great ideas, that's awesome. But I want to provide this as a tool for you to be able to say, okay, how do we brainstorm? So let's say I'm going to give you an example with the pancake printer. Let's say I'm making it. Um, you don't have to use my functional requirements. You can very much use your own functional requirements here. 
Okay. So say pancake printer. And then let's see. Okay. I've got limited board space and I'm gonna try to keep this half open. So that may involve me. Oh, you can still see me over here. Hi. Okay, let's start with I'm just gonna write out the function, the functional requirements first. Okay, so functional requirements. So what am I th what is it that I'm requiring uh, this device to do? Well, it has to be able to, I think I even gave you this in the document. Um, I, you can always expand on these, but I know it has to be able to uh, move pancake batter Um, and some of that involves squirting it out onto a heated tray, something like that. Um, has to be able to cook pancakes. Uh, I don't remember what the third one was. It had something to do with control, I believe. Um, had to be able to extrude the solution. That's right. Somehow you have to be able to get the solution from where it's stored to the hot plate, okay? And this is, you have to be able to get the pancake batter to take the correct shape that you want. Something like that, okay? Um, so these are my functional requirements. And I'm not gonna add anything onto this because I think this is already hard enough. Um, you can always add more. Or you can maybe on this you need to have, uh, has to, um, Maybe it has to assess whether or not the pancake is done. Okay, that could be a functional requirement. You could also have the functional requirement of it has to measure the consistency of the pancake, or it has to, maybe you're going to make your pancake mix be a full blend, where you add water, you add pancake mix, and it autonomously mixes them, comes up with its own solution, and then pumps it out. That would be a lot easier to store. It may not be as messy. Um, maybe that's what something that you would want your pancake printer to do. I don't know. I only gave you three. These three. I'm gonna stick with these three. Okay. And then down here, we talk about constraints. Okay. Again, constraints are just yes/no conditions that your solution has to abide by in order to be valid. Here, I didn't. I don't think I gave you constraints. Um, because really, you know, if you want to use a flamethrower for your heating element, go ahead. Um, this is going to be specific to my solution. For my solution, it's going to use 110 volt AC power input. Okay. And already I have thrown out every solution that does not require an electric heating element. Okay. Wood fire burning, propane, um, fuel cell. This, I have just demanded that my system run off of easily accessible power. Okay? That's what a constraint does. It reduces my freedom, but it simplifies my design process because now I don't have to make that decision. I don't have to consider what's powering this. Okay? I don't have to come up with that. Um, so it runs off of 110 volt AC power input. Uh, we're going to say this is going to have to cost less than uh, $1,500. Let's say $1,500. It's ridiculous to spend more than $1,500 printing pancakes, considering this is a fairly novelty device. Okay. Um, so it has to cost less than $1,500 has to run off of electric power source. Um, and let's say it's going to have to store pancake solution on board. Meaning I don't have some pump and then I have to like prepare a, a batter mix and put it next to this and then have it siphon out of it with a straw. No, actually I'm gonna put it directly in the machine. 
um, you'll notice that this constraint is something that the original pancake um, printer had on it. It actually had a syringe with a pancake mix in there. It would hydraulically, uh, pneumatically, it would push out uh, the solution by increasing the pressure and the air supply given to the syringe. Okay, so those are my functional requirements. These are my constraints. This limits my ability. I can't make this out of solid gold. I cannot make this an extraordinarily complex robotic solution, which I could probably get it to do anything at that point. This has to be a real solution. <laughs> that does make it harder, but also makes it easier because now it eliminates a bunch of potential solutions. When we go into our ideation phase, okay, the goal of going into the ideation phase is I have a problem. Um, I can take any solution and see if it fits that problem. Any solution at all, okay? Um, one of my favorite examples to use is a light pole, okay? Um, can I use a light pole to move pancake batter? Well, probably not because there's not a lot of there's not a lot of moving elements in a light pole. But I could use a light pole to cook the pancakes. So technically, I could actually make a light pole be part of my solution. You flip a light pole upside down, cook it right there on the light, just shine light at it for long enough. I've already come up with a solution. It's ridiculous, but it is a solution. Just because it's ridiculous does not mean it does not bring something to this. Okay, If my light pole can cook a pancake, could I use light as a, as a means of cooking a pancake? Well, yes, um, there are ways of cooking things with light. Have you ever seen a solar burner? You could make this a solar power pancake printer, so to speak, uh, where it's charged by some solar panel as an onboard battery storage, in which case that wouldn't use 110 volts AC. It would uh, use an onboard probably a 12 volt battery power supply with converters and all that. Um, and then it would cook the pancake using a solar array. Saves a lot of energy. All of your energy is just in the control of it. You could do something like that. That's perfectly reasonable, okay? And all of that happened because I said, I'm gonna pursue the ridiculous idea of does a light pole cook pancakes? In the ideation phase, we are oftentimes limited most by our own creativity. You do not have to limit yourself. Okay, a, a standard heating plate, um, clearly that didn't work for the pancake printer. It was very slow. You come up with a better way to do it where you're actually frying it using lasers? That would work a lot better. You could extrude much faster. Uh, might make the consistency a little bit weird, but you could totally do this with light. A directed light beam. Okay. So when it comes down to this, what you really want for the absolute best picture of all of this, you want every single possible solution that can possibly satisfy all of your functional requirements while maintaining inside of your constraints, okay? Um, because of my constraints, I cannot use a solar panel cooker. That's fine with me. I eliminate solar panel cooking, great. This cannot be powered by the sun, no. It has to be powered by conventional power supply. We've lost that. I have also lost, as I said, the flamethrowers, wood burning options, those types of things, steam options. This is entirely digital and it entirely runs off of power. Okay? Now, that doesn't mean I can't use directed light. Um, that is still a solution. But so what I will do is for each of these, I'm going to write out potential solutions that could possibly solve, that could possibly do that. So let's say, move batter. Is that how you spell batter? It just looks weird now that I'm looking at it. This is how you spell pancake batter. Okay, the word looks weird. 
Um, it's got to be able to move the better. How do you move things? Well, you can create a 2D array and move things with um, linear motion bearings. That's one. That's that's how most 3D printers work. That's how the original pancake printer worked. Um, so we've got air, motion, um, motors. Basically motors that just move along the line. Okay. We could go with a spherical solution where you have an arm that rotates and that has full three-dimensional movement capabilities. Okay. Like a robotic arm. Okay, we could actually physically use a robotic arm to locate and put down all of this. I can tell you this is harder to code than this is. But maybe you just like punishment. Um, this gives you a lot more flexibility because, because with the same system, just simply moving it up and down gives you the ability to print just about anything. Um, if you combine these two, you have an infinite size 3D printer. So that's pretty cool. Um, with these, they're very limited by the size of your linear motion. I mean, you could connect multiple of them in, in series, I guess, but um, it's you're still very limited. Uh, it becomes much more difficult. This has a much more concise power supply to it. Um, everything is, is a little bit easier to work with. So if you were to combine both of these, though, you would have the best, in my opinion. Now, that's not going to match your cost requirements. So having both of these together in one solution probably gets thrown out as a potential solution because it, it, um, it violates your constraints. Okay. Uh, how else can you move pancake powder? Well, you could have a rolling wheel. Okay, um, we could approach this like how we approach printing. Okay, uh, inkjet printing, they spray ink on a roller and then they roll the roll across paper. Okay, maybe we roll batter on this roller and then we roll it across the heating plate and it comes off of the roller onto the heating plate where it then cooks. That is a solution. I'd be much faster than what already exists. And it's something that wouldn't cost $1,500. There you go. There's an idea right there. Um, we could also do something where we do a shake table. If you come up with a form and you create a form for your pancake, you put it on the heating tray, and then you shake that form, the fluid that's in there, because it is a fluid, will eventually seep into all the crevices. And then maybe you cook it. Okay. Again, cheaper than $1,500. Moves the pancake batter. And you can do it a lot faster than the existing printer. So already we're making improvements. And all we've done is step one. Just because we've been willing to, to think about weird ideas. Um, how else can you move things? Okay. You can try, maybe you, you do a press mold. Like, uh, like when you do injection molding, you create a mold and you, you push it all in. Um, we could make this be an injection mold. Maybe you have some way of, of generating these molds or you, you inform people how to build their own molds. So then it's just an injection molded uh, pancake printer. Okay. Again, well, the molds themselves may cost a lot, um, but it would cost less than $1,500. It would certainly fulfill all of these functional requirements. There's another solution right there. Already faster than what exists. Faster than this. So that can keep going forever. Um, if I just sit here long enough, I could probably come up with five or ten more ideas. Um, this is this is brainstorming. How can we move stuff? Here's ideas. Here's how here's how we can do this one functional requirement. 
Okay, and this is this all of these here. These three are would fundamentally change how this looks, just because it's it's a different form, a different whole mechanism that takes a rolling wheel. You'll notice all of these items right here are physical items. All of these functional requirements are verbs. Okay, this is the action. And these are the actors. If we take our actors, we can do actions with them. This is the form. We're coming up with ideas. What we are actually doing is we are developing an understanding of not just what this is going to be made of, but what this looks like. How? How do we perform this? It's with our form. How do we do how do we cook the pancakes? Well, it's we'll come up with a list. How do we extrude the solution? We'll come up with a list. What physical mechanisms actually do that? Um, you can apply the same principle to electrical engineering and say, okay, um, what algorithms do this? What programming languages do this? What, what, what can we use best to allocate the tools that we have to solve these problems? This isn't just limited to physical solutions. You could really do this with anything. Um, this design process is not unique to just engineering. Okay, so here's my list of ideas for number one, moving pancake batter. Um, you know what, I'll write the second list underneath that. I still have space. I can see all the way to right here. So number two. This is cooked pancakes. Now, I am limited by the constraints that I chose. Again, I picked 110 volts AC power supply. Here under cooking pancakes, I could very easily put wood fire burner. I could very easily put a butane lighter. Um, you could use anything, you know, throw it in a, an oven, OK? Um, mine only allows for an electric oven, but there are other kinds of ovens. So we are limited by our constraints here, but we can still try to come up with ideas. If they violate our constraints, I won't even write them down. If they violate our constraints too much, and it's a great idea, maybe our constraints are too restrictive. Maybe we decided to make some decisions here that were unnecessary. Part of the ideation process is also coming up with ideas, looking at this and saying, well, is this a good idea? And does our constraints and functional requirements allow us to do this great idea? If not, can we make it work? Or is there a way that we could just adjust the problem requirements? If you can do one of those two things, you've already changed the problem. You may have a better problem, a more relevant problem. Although I really doubt anybody's going to be using a, a wood fire power pancake. <laughs> but you know what? Maybe you like the remote power aspect. You go out in the wild. Uh, crikey, you've got a pancake printer. I can't use it. Go and grab my some, some Kindle and light on fire. Yes. Oh, that happened. You know, usually when I do my accents in class, they're not recorded. You can watch these videos as many times as you want. All right, cooked pancakes. We got an oven. We have a griddle. We have a microwave. We have light radiation. Gamma radiation. We're going to cook this thing with power of the sun. Um, each one of these would require different functionality. Uh, now, the original pancake printer went with a griddle. Great. Um, they made some assumptions when they put the griddle together. The griddle has to be on the bottom. It can't be something where the griddle comes down and cooks it from the top. Their idea wouldn't have worked with that, but maybe your idea could. You're not restricted by the location on any of these things. The oven doesn't have to be open or closed. 
Which one is more efficient? Well, a closed oven is more efficient. An open oven may be faster, because then you run it through there, run it back out. Maybe some kind of a, a rolling conveyor belt, where the pancake comes in, pancake comes out. You could do that. You could do that with light radiation, too, or probably not with a microwave, because then you'd be radiating everything around it. Um, we do have to consider ethics here. Some of the unwritten constraints are no killing people. The operator should survive using this. Nobody dies, nobody gets hurt, no lawsuits, okay? I didn't write those constraints on here, but they're kind of implicit. Um, I should have written them out there. Nobody dies, nobody gets hurt. Okay. Nobody dies, and low probability of injury, because that's important. Um, and then also um, reusable, that kind of a thing. You could probably come up with a pancake printer where you use it once, and you're like, yeah, it's just self-destructed. That is one solution, a self-destructing pancake printer. Who would buy that? I certainly don't know. Maybe if somebody was just very paranoid about reusing their pancake printers, they would appeal to them, make a killing off of them. They'd probably go broke, didn't matter how much money they had. <laughs> I want pancakes again tonight. Nigel, get me pancakes. We, gotta, we ran out of pancake printers. Only one pancake pr pancake printer. We got a whole stash of broken ones out back. They're all perfectly fine. Just used them once already. Oh, yeah, I'm done. Okay. Once again, though, these are actors. These are physical form devices, okay? All of these, they are actors. They are actors that actively cook pancakes, but they are physical. And when we call in a design process, what we call physical entity is form. What actually physically does something. The components, the nuts and bolts and washers, the, the rollers, the pins, um, the the sheet metal cre creations that, that comprise this, okay? That's all the form. All right, let's do the last one. Um, I feel like I keep getting off topic here. So we'll go to item number three now, which is extrude the solution. Now, we know from the original pancake... Um, printer that they just use a pneumatic pump uh, that would push air through and put and they could control the airflow um, and control how much pancake batter was being extruded at a time okay so we know that a pneumatic pump is one solution um, instead of using pneumatics we could always go with uh, having some kind of a an electrically actuated um, pump I've actually seen a, it's a very interesting way of pumping fluids. Uh, it uses a spinning rotor um, against a flexible tubing that basically creates a vacuum that sucks the material through. Um, that's very interesting. I just dropped my marker. Um, it's very interesting, works. You could do something like that. You can come up with a better pump too. I'm not limiting you to the kind of pump. I'm certain underneath these, you could list 10,000 different part numbers of pumps that would work for this. All of them are okay. I'm just giving you broad categories because literally the ideation phase, you may come up with millions of solutions. If you were to sit down and write down every single one of these, there's different types of pneumatic pumps. There's different ways of doing it. We could come up with millions of different options and compare them against each other, everything, coming up with ideas. Um, it's just ridiculous at that point. Okay, electrically actuated pump, awesome. Um, lots of different ways to do that. Uh, we could be talking about a squeezable bladder. Maybe you pour your pancake solution into some kind of a, a soft, flexible, or a soft, 
rubber uh, pouch and it just gets squeezed. And as it gets squeezed, it protrudes out one end. That's another option that allows you to extrude the solution. Okay, um, we could do a solution where it involves a, a spinning rotor that actually physically picks up the solution, moves it, and deposits it. This is just like a wooden spoon. A wooden spoon that goes. There are other ways that you can handle it other than a wooden spoon. It doesn't necessarily have to be a wooden spoon. Um, you could use a metal tool. You could use something rubber. Maybe you can figure out a, a hydrophobic coating on a, a substance. That means that when it scoops it in, the batter, because it is water-laden, uh, doesn't actually stick to it, and it rolls off very nicely. There are some super hydrophobic materials where water will actually roll down this tire incline at a five-degree angle. It's fantastic. Um, I should really show that video to you. Uh, Bill Gates invested a lot into that material, um, trying to develop uh, waterless toilets. Um, now, ultimately, that process was far too expensive to develop a toilet, particularly for rural regions. But I applaud the fact that he was pursuing a brand new idea. It was very unique. Um, and in this way, we could also just do a gravity drip. Okay, maybe you have some kind of a a uh, flow valve that opens and closes, and it determines how much flows out based on how much gravity is pulling it down. Gravity pulls it down so far. There you go. All of these, again, represent five different ideas. I'm sure that we could come up with more. I'm just not going to spend the time on it. So what happens? We've come up with bunches of different ideas. we come up with Different ideas of how to extrude, different ideas of how to cook, different ideas of how to move. All of them completely satisfy our constraints or can be made to satisfy our constraints. What do we do now? We've got all these different individual items that functionally do what we needed to do. What's next? I'm going to take some of my favorite ideas that I just wrote down and put them all together. So in my ideation phase, um, one of my favorite ideas is uh, I really liked, um, let's say I really liked, I'm going to take one idea from each of these functional requirements and I'm going to smash them together. Okay. I can do this with every single idea that I generate and generate the number of, of total options is going to be each group, the number of options multiplied by each other. It becomes exponentially larger, the more functional requirements we have, and the more options we came up with for every single functional requirement, uh, it begins growing very quickly. The problem gets huge. Um, so let's say one of my favorite uh, ideas that we came up with was, uh, I'm drawing a blank. I have no idea what I just wrote on the board. I just erased everything. should have kept one. I didn't keep any of them. Um, Let's say I really like the oven idea. Okay, so that satisfies number two. Um, let's say I like, a, I didn't write it on there, but let's say I like a conveyor belt option where we extrude it and we use a conveyor belt or a vibration table. Uh, I guess I like the vibration table. Maybe we just tilt it upward and vibrate it until the droplets go into place. We use a super hydrophobic material, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, and then here for extrusion, we're just going to do a gravity system. Okay, that is one solution. 
It satisfies my functional requirements because I made it satisfy my functional requirements. I went out and found ideas that satisfy my functional requirements, and I put them together. Is this the best solution? I don't know. It's one solution. All I had to do was take different ideas that I came up with for these functions and stick them together. And I can make them work that way. And now I have a brand new idea. This is a fundamentally different pancake printer than has ever been built before. Is it better? I don't know. I can't promise anything. But I ensure try. So putting these three ideas together, uh, my system looks like this. So I have some kind of a reservoir up here that stores the pancake solution on board. It's already mixed up. The machine doesn't have to mix it up itself. Okay. Here I have a release valve. This is part of my gravity drip. And that release valve can be controlled uh, by some kind of a controlling mechanism, like a computer or something. Okay. And then the drips come out, go down this chute, basically, which is an ultra uh, super hydrophobic material, which allows this material to roll off without leaving any residue. So this is um, ultra hydrophobic material. And so it just rolls off and it reaches a platform here which is located inside of an oven. Okay, and this platform can move up and down and side to side, but can also tilt. This is also a, an ultra hydrophobic material. Okay, the platform that we're gonna be cooking on. That's going to allow us to then slide the pancake out and it's gonna leave very little residual. It's gonna be easy to clean that way. Okay. So this is an oven. Um, what this does is it shakes, and maybe it has multiple components in there that shake, and that, that can lift up and do whatever uh, to create different shapes inside of there. Um, maybe each one of them has an individual set of motors attached. I don't know. Um, whatever the case, uh, we have this shaking table. Um, maybe we even have a mold that we can stick in there that we can print out the same pancake every time. I don't know. Um, that's part of understanding the form of what actually comprises uh, the vibration table. We give a general idea. Okay, it's going to be a vibration table, uh, but then there's there's a lot more that goes into how do we make that work? How do we put it all together? How do we consign the pieces so that they they look pretty? Okay, but this is one idea. And I could roll with this idea, and I'm done. Okay. Um, now it's generally not a good idea to pick the very first idea and run with it. Uh, you take all the other ideas that we came up with, and you pair them together. Can you come up with something like this? I had to come up with a lot of the details on the spot just to just to combine these three elements together so that it does what I want it to do. I still had to to on the spot come up with those. But every time you try to jam three ideas together, it's going to generate something different. It should. And it's it's wonderful. Um, part of the ideation process, it, there's so much creativity involved. I love creativity. I love seeing people come up with brand new ideas. And this is how we can do it. That's all it takes. Um, now, the book... The book recommends that I'm going to draw this figure up here. When it comes to generating form and physically taking the transition between what we've defined as our problem and what we can come up with for the solution, um, the way that the, the book describes that problem is that uh, you have the function in the middle. You have material over here. This is 
is this plastic? What kind of plastic? Is this aluminum? What kind of aluminum? Is this steel? What kind of steel? What are each of the pieces made out of? Okay, are you dealing with, with a coating? Are you gonna deal with composite material? Is it gonna be a material where maybe it's a metal screw that has a rubber washer on it? Okay, is it something that requires multiple material choices? It all depends on what you want it to do. What does it actually do? Over here on this side, it gives production, which production is how do you how do you make it, how do you build it, how do you assemble it, how do you manufacture it, how are you gonna take whatever you design and mass market it so that everybody can use it. These interact, these interact, these interact. Some materials are just harder to manufacture. If you have to have a certain material, because either that's what you already have on hand, uh, it begins to dominate this side. Form, what does it look like? These interact, these interact, and form consists of um, your constraints. That is, what does it have to do in order to satisfy this? Um, a lot of what the book talks about is physical constraints, um, sizing constraints, that kind of a thing. Um, Talk about configuration. That's how are your components arranged. They talk about uh, connection. How are you? How are you going to connect your pieces together? Uh, are you going to use bolts? Are you going to use screws? Are you going to use wooden lattice? Um, or are you going to epoxy them together? Uh, and then last is components. What are you physically building for each of your individual pieces? So if one of these sides dominates the conversation, if you focus too much on form, um, you're really gonna be missing out on material decisions and, and you may have a hard time doing production. If you focus too much on production, your thing may suck, okay? Um, those Chinese toys that they make that they put in Happy Meals uh, that come from China, um, those are very easy to manufacture, but they're not the most high quality toys. They're not the kind of toys, you know, not the kind of toys where you uh, usually fight over them. Back in the, uh, what was it, the, the early 2000s, late 90s, uh, they released Beanie Babies inside of McDonald's Happy Meals. Um, people would fight over those. It was violent. It was a very violent time in fast food history. Uh, they, they weren't so focused on production there. They were actually focused on very much the form and the material. They were extremely expensive to produce, but people would fight over them. Why? Because McDonald's figured out what the people wanted. So it was hard to produce, but it was a well-designed creation that was the kind of materials that were consistent with Beanie Babies at the time. Okay, very collectible. Having one edge of this dominate tends to deter the quality. What you have to do in a well-designed piece is not just focus on form. Okay, all the work that we did to come up with form, now we have to figure out what kind of material. Well, I threw out the, the ultra hydrophobic material, which is great. The ultra hydrophobic material would probably do everything I want it to do. It's very expensive to make, very difficult to replicate, and it would cause the price of the device to skyrocket if we made much of it out of this ultra hydrophobic material. Also much harder to produce also limits what you can make the form out of because ultra hydrophobic material, um, you have to make it a certain way. You can't have components look normal. You can't do normal manufacturing processes on components and get them to be easy, ultra hydrophobic. So maybe I have to rethink my material. Maybe I just need to be something with a Teflon coating. You can put a Teflon coating on anything. Put a Teflon coating on, now all of a sudden my form opens up and it's much easier to produce. And it's significantly cheaper. And people know how to manage a Teflon coating, put in protections in there, make sure people don't scrape it off. So while coming up with a form, it is critical that you understand all three areas of this triangle and realize that all of them are contributing to the function simultaneously. Okay? 
Teflon coating will not do as well. Your measures of quality will be lower than, than a, an ultra hydrophobic coating, uh, which can be made very robust. But it, it, while it will damage the function, it doesn't deplete it to put on a Teflon coating. So, okay, um, you have no reading assignment for tonight. You do have modeling learning assignment for tonight. Um, and I believe that is it. We don't have any other homework due today. So that's nice. Um, you will have a homework assignment next week. I believe that is over tolerancing and performance. Um, we'll talk about that then. Um, you will have, I believe, your first project assignment is next week. Um, we will be talking about that more in SOLIDWORKS because it is a SOLIDWORKS-related issue. Um, if you have any questions about this lecture or about the class, please feel free to email me. Um, you know how to find me. Good luck.